um, Greg is going to give you, Greg Chanos is our speaker for tonight. He's the NASA Solar System Ambassador, passionate astronomer, as well as a uh, doctor of pharmacy. He is a member of four different astronomy clubs and some professional organizations like ALPO. And uh, he comes to us from the skyscrapers of Rhode Island all via Florida to date. Um, okay, so journey to a comet. Today I'm going to talk about fundamentals of comets and also I'm going to talk about um, the uh, NASA and ESA space spacecraft that actually went and visited the comets. Actually, six comets total were visited by spacecraft. Okay, so um, historical perspective. Um, <clears throat> the ancients looked at the heavens as perfect and orderly, and uh, they saw the heavens as absolute perfection, and something like a comet disrupted that perfection. And uh, Aristotle in 4th century BC believed that comets were some sort of, um, was some sort of uh, terrestrial uh, meteor. Uh, a meteorological weather phenomenon, and of course that's dead wrong. And astrologers interpret as sudden appearances uh, of comets, that they always saw a negative, all the cultures as ill omens, famine, flood, death of kings. So Halley, Halley's Comet was followed down through the ages and made a foreboding experience in the Middle Ages. And um, every passage of the comet since 240 has been recorded. And then here we have the Bayou, uh, Bayou Tapestry, Battle of Hastings, 1066. You all see the comet? It actually shows Halley's Comet there. And then if you look, if you want to go, oh, wow, look at that, <laughs> you know? See, so it actually shows Halley's Comet <clears throat> and then, um, and then uh, Edmund Halley, and then uh, remember the um, the ancients believed in um, the Earth-centered universe, and the sun went around the uh, the Earth, and then Copernicus put the center, put the sun in the center, and the uh, Earth and the planets went around the sun, but he kept the perfect circle idea, okay, that went in perfect circles because this idea of perfection, a circle is symmetric all the way around. And then Kepler ke made the great discovery that planets are not um, perfect circles, but they're in, uh, well, that's my hand, oh yeah, they're in ugly ellipses or an egg shape. Um, and then in 1705, um, Edmund Halley found that these comets had almost the same orbits and returned every 76 years. And he made the correct conclusion that they were indeed the same comet. And he predicted the return in 1758, which indeed took place. However, he didn't live long enough to see it. He died in 1742, but if you subtract these two years, he lived 86 years old. Think of it, in the 1700s to reach 86, a lot of people didn't make adolescence back then. So that, that was really an accomplishment. And uh, although the comet is named after him, he did not actually discover it. Comets are named after their discoveries up to three, up to three uh, discoverers and all. So if you're the fourth person, you're, your name's not gonna go on it. So, um, but this is the only comet that that was not discovered by an individual, but named after him because he did make a, a great discovery that all these, uh, that the, the comets every 76 years was indeed the same comet. And uh, let's see. So Fred Whipple, the father of cometary studies. So the original idea in the 1800s was the flying sandbank model, which proposed that a comet was a cloud of meteoritic particles held together by its own gravity. And gases were absorbed onto the surfaces of dust grains and escaped when the comet came close to the sun and the particles were heated, dead wrong. In 1950, uh, Fred Whipple, Dr. Fred Whipple uh, came up with the uh, icy conglomerate theory that a, a dirty snowball theory that a comet has an actual nucleus inside. He suggested that it's an icy core inside a thin insulating layers of dirt and jets of material ejected as a result of solar heating with a cause of orbital changes. And then, um, 
So this was all based on indirect evidence that he had. And then we'll mention the Giotto spacecraft actually flew by Comet Halley and photographed the nucleus in March of, 80, of 1986. So, uh, Dr. Whipple was vindicated. And uh, w w uh, Skyscrapers was honored to have Fred Whipple right here um, lecture to us um, on October 4, 1986. And uh, he was age 80 then. He died 97 years old. Wow, that's a great lifespan. And I was 27 at the time and still have my hair, although it's turning white. <laughs> but I'm 61 now. so. It double my age, but um, let's see. So anatomy of a comet. So these are the main things, the nucleus, the coma, dust tail and plasma tail. This you don't see really a hydrogen on envelope. It's an invisible layer of hydrogen surrounding the coma. I didn't even know this existed before I started researching this. So the nucleus is the main solid part of the comet, like we mentioned, it's composed of rock dust and frozen gases. Now you never see it, it's buried deep within the coma, which is a halo of evaporated gas, water vapor, ammonia, carbon dioxide, cyanide, and dust that surrounds the nucleus. And uh, and then um, the dust tail is composed, like it says, basically of dust that are pushed away by the pressure of sunlight. And then the plasma or ion tail, it has three names, gas tail, ion tail, or plasma tail. They all synonymous, they mean the same thing. It's composed of electrically charged gas particles, ions of carbon dioxide, nitrogen, water, and cyanide, the spiral around magnetic fields in the solar wind. So I'll talk about each of these individually in a little more detail. <clears throat> so the nucleus is a solid central part, like I mentioned, rock dust and frozen gases. So when heated by the sun, the gas is sublime and produce an atmosphere surrounding the nucleus known as the coma. Now sublimation is the process of, um, you've all probably experienced it. Have you, have you ever seen dry ice? Dry ice is frozen carbon dioxide. And uh, if you leave it out on a countertop, you'll never have water. It just goes from a solid to a gas and it's actually heavier than water, denser. So it doesn't, you see the smoke, the vapor is rising up as it's subliming, but they go down, they go over the edge of the table and down. Okay, and they use that in rock concerts and they just blow it around and probably add a little light or, or dye to it to give it colors, but that's what sublimation is, okay? Turning from a solid to a gas. And most cometary nuclei are thought to be no more than 10 miles across. The density is 0.3 to 0.6 grams per cubic centimeter. Now density, as you know, is mass over volume. And um, water has a density of one gram per cubic centimeter. So anything, less than one will float on water. So if we could put a cometary nucleus in a tub of wa fresh water, it would actually float. And uh, the nucleus of comets are fragile, a conclusion supported by comets splitting apart. A lot of comets really do uh, split apart and we'll talk more about that in a bit. And comets are suspected of splitting by thermal stress, internal pressure or impact. Uh, cometary nuclei are among the darkest objects in the solar system. And um, the albedo of a comet, now albedo is just a fancy term for reflectivity. So uh, how much light an object reflects back is known as the albedo. So um, a mirror, a telescopic mirror would reflect 100% of the light hitting it. Tar, freshly, uh, freshly paved asphalt would reflect 7%. See, so you, those are like the two extremes. So uh, cometary nuclei are closer to uh, asphalt, actually even lower, three to 6%. So they're even blacker than the darkest tar you can imagine. Okay, so they're very, very dark. Okay, um, the coma. The coma is the nebulous envelope that surrounds the nucleus of a comet formed when the comet passes close to the sun. So 
as, a, as the comet warms, parts of its sublime giving a fuzzy appearance. I mentioned what sublimation is. Uh, water dominates 90% of the volatiles that outflow the comets within three to four AU of the sun. Remember an astronomical unit is 93 million miles, the average distance from the earth to the sun. So it's easier to think in rather than Nine, well, not 90 times two would be 270 plus million miles. It's easy to say three AU, you know? And then uh, Comet Holmes, this was really cool. I remember seeing this in 2007. It was visible in binoculars and just barely visible naked eye. But this was odd because it had no tails, no plasma, no dust tail. It was just like pure coma. Isn't that cool? And this, and here's where the nucleus would be. That is not the nucleus you're seeing. That's just the jets coming out. The nucleus is very dark. And um, the water molecule is destroyed primarily by photo dissociation to H plus and OH minus. So think of H2O and see here's one H and there's the other H, there's H2 and O. Now water can break apart or dissociate, let me see, okay. And into H plus and OH minus, okay? So that's the way to think of it. And this is kind of the basis of the pH scale too, because water dissociates one times 10 to negative 14th. Uh, it doesn't dissociate very much, but, uh, and then we take the negative log base 10 of that of the hydronium ion, you get 14. And then when you have, uh, equal amounts of hydrogen and oxygen, you have neutral pH. And if you have more H plus, you have acid. If you have more OH, which is less than seven, if you have more OH greater than eight, you have um, a base, see? So that's where the whole pH scale and everything comes from water. But water dissociates into H plus and OH minus, okay? So that's an important point. And the coma contains other molecules such as ammonia, carbon dioxide, and cyanide. Okay, anatomy of a comet, the dust tail. So the dust tail starts to form around the orbit of Mars. And as the sun heats the nucleus, the comet releases dust and gas. And, uh, and then the, the, the sun also exerts kind of a pressure, radiation pressure that pushes the, the particles, the dust particles back. Okay, and they end up, since they're of different sizes, each has a unique velocity and an individual orbit around the sun. So it results in a broad dust tail. So usually they're kind of whitish, maybe yellowish. Okay, and the, and the tails always point away from the sun. Okay, so you know the sun is in this direction, not this direction, okay? Because where the tails are pointing. And uh, let's see. And most of the dust tail is composed of smoke sized grains. However, there's larger grains there. And then uh, what ends up happening to the dust uh, the, the dust tail of a comet is actually responsible for uh, meteor storms, okay? So when we have our annual Geminids and uh, Perseid meteors, they're actually due to the, uh, to the dust tail of comets. Isn't that neat? So I'll, I have a slide on that in a little bit. Okay, anatomy of a comet, the plasma tail. So the plasma tail forms closer to the sun than the dust and um, ultraviolet light strips one or more electrons from a gas atom in a coma, creating an ion, a process called ionization. Since plasma ion tails are made of ionized gases, strongly affected by magnetic field in the wind. Okay, they usually appear turbulent and um, they follow the magnetic field lines rather than the orbital trajectory. And the reason they appear bluish is because of ionized carbon monoxide. So usually when you see a plasma tail, it's due to carbon monoxide. So here's my first, um, let's see. While you're grabbing that, Greg, could I just point out you have a, yeah. there's a neat remnant from a separation in the upper left-hand corner yeah, yeah. of that image. There is, yeah. That's called the disconnection event, Scott. You're one of the original ladies crew. <laughs> and uh, and uh, how many people are on right now? 28 still or more? Currently 34. 34, okay. Yeah, I need that because this counts as a NASA ambassador event. So they need to know how many participants. Okay, so see this cool little plasma ball? You've seen this in museums. So what, what this is, is um, 
it's a ball and uh, it has a vacuum inside and it's filled with four noble gases, basically neon, argon, krypton, and xenon. And um, there's a Tesla coil in the middle and it, and it lets out an electricity and the electricity ionizes the gas. So what happens is as um, a neutral atom has the same amount of protons and electrons, if you add energy and you strip off one of the electrons, there's more positive uh, charge in the nucleus, so therefore it's positive, and that's what the ion is. And then as, as the uh, electrons come down from a higher energy state, they emit a photon of light, so that's the light you're seeing. And then here, it, and then if you add um, a magnet, in this case the finger works fine, see how it's uh, going to it? Isn't that cool? So it's, uh, it follows the magnetic field lines and not the orbital path, the plasma tail, see? So does everyone kind of have an idea of what a plasma is? Yes, thank you. Okay, so this is kind of a neat demonstration. Okay, turn the lights back on <laughs> so we can see. Okay, so that's basically the plasma tail. Yeah, good eye, Scott. Yep, that, that's, uh, I'm gonna get to that because comets lose their tails, believe it or not their plasma tails. So uh, rarer tails, the anti-tail. Now, now th this I didn't know before I was researching this, and I'll read this and then I have a nice little demonstration here too. The anti-tail is a spike projected from the coma that seems to go towards the sun rather than back. It's basically an optical illusion. The larger dust particles are less affected by the sun's radiation pressure and tend to remain roughly around the com comet's orbital plane and eventually form a disk around the, the comet's orbit. As the sun passes, as the earth passes through the orbital plane, the disk is seen side on and appears characteristic spike. Anti-tail is normally visible only a brief period of time. Okay, so what they're saying is, can everyone see this, right? So yep. this here is the nucleus of the comet and this white paper here represents, <clears throat> represents the, all, all the dust, all right, basically in a plane. And what happens is when we cross the orbital plane of a comet, instead of looking at it like this, that we normally see it, we're seeing it edge on. So see what happens when it's edge on? You see a spike. I should actually put it closer here. You see a spike coming off the front and this, oh, actually this is the, the side here. There's less here. So this <clears throat> would be the, would be this spike here, okay? And then the rest of this just blends in with the, uh, with the dust. So does that make sense? So normally we're kind of seeing it like this. So the, the anti-tail blends into the background, but when you're seeing it edge on like this, you, you see that characteristic spike. Does that make sense to everyone? Yes. But Remember, everybody's yeah. muted. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, all right. So th that's that's my little demo for that, <clears throat> all right? So it's basically an optical illusion. So when, so when you're crossing the orbital plane, you're looking along the edge and you actually see the, the dust, the, that spike. And this comet is the only one that you find in all the textbooks, Ar Arne and Roland, that actually had a beautiful, really long um, anti-tail. Most anti-tails, if you see them are like this long, <laughs> they're, they're very, very small. Okay, so the plasma tail, um, oh, I did that already. Okay, here we are. Sodium tail, I didn't know this existed. <laughs> and most astronomers didn't either until Comet Hillbop came in the late nineties and a neutral sodium tail consists of electronically neutral sodium sodium atoms. Now we can't see this as amateur astronomers, but they also detected in an, this comet Giacopini Zinner through a spacecraft. So here, here, this is what we can see. There's the nucleus, the coma, there's the ion or dust, our plasma tail, here's the dust tail, and then this is the sodium tail. Isn't that neat? I didn't know that ever existed. <laughs> and neither did everyone else before 1997. So that's kind of neat. 
Okay. Uh, now this is a little bit um, interplanetary magnetic fields and sector boundary crossings. Okay. So uh, the solar wind flows away from the sun. The interplanetary magnetic field is carried with it and has a spiral shape. And along the ecliptic plane, has two to four sectors with, that rotates every 27 days. The surface separating the polarities is called heliospheric current. And um, a, a sector boundary crossing is the polarity reverses. Okay, so what does all this mean? If you look at this diagram, pictures worth a thousand words. Here's the sun, here's the earth, here's the earth going around the sun in its orbit, okay? And then as the sun rotates, it has this, um, interplanetary magnetic field. So this is the magnetic field of the sun as it rotates, it has a spiral shape. So here it's showing two, there could be as many as four, okay? Well, okay, so here's one and here's two. Now, um, what happens is this, this area here has a different magnetic uh, field than this area here. So why is that important? Because Comets lose their plasma tails, like Scott Tracy was talking about. So what happens is two mechanisms. Uh, you could have an increase in ambient solar wind pressure that gives rise to plasma instabilities in the tail, or, or you can, uh, mo most of the theoretical modeling is based on sector boundary crossing. And here we see Comet Enki, which is a short period comet. And then this is a flux rope. And a flux rope is a result of a coronal mass ejection, which is uh, when a significant amount of plasma and magnetic field are released from the solar wind. Usually when you get a uh, coronal mass ejection, you get auroras, you know. But uh, here, so notice what happens. As the comet, here's the tail, as it crosses this, Mag this uh, sector boundary, notice it loses its tail because the, the magnetic field is different. So I have a little demonstration of this. I have two magnets here, okay? And then uh, one's north and one's south. So remember from basic, you know, elementary school, you know, north and south uh, light opposite poles attract, light poles repel, okay? So here's the repulsion. So what happens is the, the comet tail, the plasma tail is moving happily. All of a sudden it hits my nose and the polarity reverses. And so it breaks off and then this goes away and this continues on. See that? So now if we were live, I would pass these magnets. I can, you know, get the feel of it all and also this plasma ball book. So does that kind of make sense to everybody? So when, when the magnetic polarity reverses, you get a break in the plasma tail. So that's the, the basic, uh, that's it basically in a nutshell. How long does a plasma tail last after it's broken in a flux? Oh, um, Oh, to grow back just takes a few days. It grows back very quickly because you still have a lot of the uh, the uh, radiation pressure ionizing, you know, the the ions in their carbon monoxide, ammonia, you know, carbon dioxide, water, all that. So it forms very quickly within days. So, and then Thank this you. tail just dissipates into space. Thank Good you. question. Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. So here we see uh, how the, so orbits a comet. So comets are classified either um, short or long period, uh, short, uh, short period are periods of years to decades, low orbital inclination and a prograde motion, which means it spins in the same direction as the orbit. So if it's moving, if it's moving in this direction, it's spinning in the same direction as the as the orbit. So that's what it means by prograde. And then um, Jupiter family comets are just a special subtype of short uh, period comets that are less than 20 years and their motions are influenced by Jupiter. Long period comets take thousands of years. Um, 18,400 years is a period of Ayakutaki. 
<laughs> so we're not going to be around to see that. And uh, they can have any inclination, high or low, and they spin opposite the direction of the orbit. And um, as the comet heads, so this shows here, um, so when it's out here, nucleus warms, starts turning to gas, coma forms when the comet is about five times further. Um, as it gets closer to the sun, the, the tail forms, all right? You get the tails, the, the plasma and the dust tails, the, the pressure, the dust tail is pushed by sunlight ion. See, so notice both tails are always pointing away from the sun. And then as it, moves away, the comb and tail disappear as the comet gets further out and then it becomes frozen again. And it just repeats the cycle as it comes back in. So that's basically, so just remember short period, long period comets, the, that's the, um, and then um, origin of comets, the Kuiper belt, uh, it's a disc shaped region around the orbit of Neptune and contains countless of icy objects, a source of short periods and Jupiter family comets such as Halley's Comet. Um, this is the reason, the Kuiper belt is the reason why um, Pluto was demoted as a planet. And uh, Clyde Tombaugh, the discoverer of Pluto actually came in 1987 to skyscrapers along with Dave Levy and and uh, I actually met him and have a picture of myself with him, but um, he was very adamant about them demoting Pluto. So the American Astronomical Union waited till he passed away <laughs> until they demoted Pluto, which was nice of them. But, you know, thinking, knowing what we know now, it was it was the right thing to do because there are, it's just the closest Kuiper Belt object is they found a lot more, um, objects and they name and they have weird names Sedna, Quor, uh, Make Make and stuff like that and they're actually larger than Pluto a lot of them so there's a lot of icy bodies planetary bodies dwarf planets that are even larger than Pluto in the Kuiper belt so Pluto is really the closest Kuiper belt object okay that's why it's been demoted to a dwarf planet. So the basic idea here is the short period comets such as Halley and Jupiter family all come from the Kuiper belt. The, uh, the long period comets come from um, the Oort cloud, which was named after Hans Oort. And this is way out there, 100,000 <laughs> astronomical units from the sun. So trillions of small icy bodies. So this is where the newer long period comets come from. And then here passing stars can perturb the Oort cloud sending comets falling into the solar system. So closest star is Proxima Centauri. And don't forget all this is moving within our galactic arm and expanding out. So everything's in constant motion. So uh, gravitational perturbations here will upset the comets and send them in or out. So that's, that's the theory for long period comets. And then cometary tails cause meteor showers. So most of the dust in the tail of a comet are composed of smoke. However, larger grains can be sheared off. And, um, and th these grains form a meteor stream, which continues to orbit the sun in the same path as the comet. And when the earth intersects it, we see a meteor shower. So, the, so Halley's Comet, here's the orbit. And then here's the earth going around the sun. So it intersects it and we have the eight Aquariids and the Orionids. So both of these are due to Halley's Comet depending on the season here. And then the Perseids are due to um, the orbit of uh, Comet Swift-Tuttle. And, and there's an interesting fact too, I didn't even notice it, Dave Levy made me aware of it. Uh, Sarasota, Florida has, um, a main road called Swift and Tuttle. <laughs> and, and they're like this, I gotta take a, I took a picture of it, I gotta find it, Swift Tuttle. <laughs> so that's really interesting. And what are the odds of that? And uh, it, it, the only two meteor showers uh, that are really worth observing are the Perseids in the summer, because each has at least a hundred meteors per hour and the Geminids 120. And in our light polluted skies, I observe these every year religiously, given the, um, you know, if it's not cloudy and uh, I submit it to the International Meteor Association, I take uh, counts and um, 
and also to Alpo. And uh, the most I usually see is 20 to 30 in my moderately light polluted sky. So um, let's see. And then this one, 3220 Phaethion. This is really weird. The origin of the Gemini. I looked it up. This is, they call it like a rock comet. This is actually within the asteroid belt, but it emits dust and gas, which is really weird. So this is kind of a weird object, but that's the that's the Geminids, okay? And the Perseids is Swift Tuttle. So just, just everyone here has observed meteors, so I don't have to belabor the point. Okay, Shoemaker Levy Nine. How many people have seen this? Yeah, a lot, most everybody, right? Well, Shoemaker Levy Nine, th I wish this occurred during the digital age. Because think of it, 1994, we were at Windows 3.1. <laughs> we weren't even at Windows 95 yet, right? So think of how primitive computers were then, all right? And, and now I, I like to image planets as well as deep sky. So, you know, with your little ZWO planet and even a webcam, we would have gotten such beautiful, you know, images of this. But either way, um, what happened is that the nucleus of this comet split into uh, 20, 20 discrete fragments and they were up to 1.2 miles and they impacted at, six, at 129,600 miles per hour, a bullet, fired from a gun travels at 1,800 miles per hour. So this is going at 129,600 times. So imagine that, okay? Much faster than a bullet. And then you had these beautiful scars and, and you could actually see these through an eight inch telescope. And what I did is, um, uh, Dave Lee, I have sketches here and Dave Levy signed uh, this on May 20, March 27, 2006. Oh, Scott, you have a cat, so do I. And uh, and then here I did my little drawings here. Is it? They're not. They're nothing great, but uh, I could actually see this stuff. I'll tell you, I can see it. I could see these much better than I could see the red spot. So. <clears throat> I, I just wish this had happened during the digital age because amateurs would have had such incredible images of this. And this is the Hubble Space Telescope and, and we would get images equal to this with today's, uh, with today's planetary cameras, but you know, timing is everything, I guess. <laughs> okay, questions regarding uh, comets in general, the anatomy, where they're from, everything. This is a good place to stop for any questions. Remember to take yourself off mute if you want to ask a question or you can throw it in the chat either way. How many people? 30. Still, still 34, you're holding okay. your attention. All right, 34, that's a good amount. Okay, any questions before we move on? So yeah. I, could you clarify, um, I, I think that this is right, but I, I just want confirmation. Okay. In the tail of the comet, yeah. Um, plasma, uh, the, what we're actually seeing is emissions from the plasma itself, right? Yes, yes, you're seeing the light from the plasma. Because what happens is, um, so you can see here, uh, what happens is the, the, you have an ion that dissociates and the electron jumps to a higher energy level. And then once it jumps back down to the ground state, as it's called, it emits a photon of light. So that's what you're seeing. So you're, you're having billions and billions of these, you know, ions going up and then coming back down and relaxing and then emitting light. So yeah, what you're seeing is, and even this, can you see, you know, even this, it's the, the light you're seeing is the, the light from the ions. Yeah. Okay. So, and, and the dust tail. Right. Contrast is reflecting light from the sun. Yes, the dust tail, oh, that's a good point. Okay. I didn't think of mentioning that. Yeah, the dust tail reflects the light from the sun and it follows the, the curved path. Um, if you look, if you look back at the, uh, the, the dust tail, see how in Hale-Bopp it's curved, 
because it's it's following the orbital curved path of the uh, comet, whereas the the plasma tail is not affected by the orbit as much. It's affected by the magnetic fields, so it's actually like spiraling around the magnetic fields that are that are present due to the radiation pressure from the sun. Okay. Greg, are you going yeah. to be talking about comet visibility prospects for 2021? Uh, no. Okay. Because are there any? That's one. Yeah, there is at least one that okay. one of our members. All right. Are save about. that. Save that till the end. That'll be a good one. That's Thank a you. question from uh, Michael Corvesa. And oh, okay. No, no, I, no. I'm not. Well, we had uh, we had uh, uh, Neil Wise, you know, the, uh, yeah. 2020, which was great during the lockdown. I'll mention that, but yeah, it won't be until December, at least. Oh, okay. Yeah. There's actually a good site that. Um, that uh, I, I would recommend looking at. Um, if you just go out to a browser and do a search on Sky and Telescope Comet Watch. Oh, okay. Um, they do a, a pretty good roundup and, and it's updated regularly. Oh, um, okay. I'm writing that down, Comet yeah. Watch. Okay. Just, uh, just, just type in Sky and Telescope Comet Watch. Okay. And they'll give you a rundown oh, you know, what comets are expected throughout the whole, the entire oh, year. Oh, great, great. You know, with the magnitudes and you know what, uh, whether you expect to see them yeah. uh, naked eye or or what equipment you should unfortunately, use. Unfortunately, unfortunately, most comets just don't get like a hail bop and high kutaki right. right and really naked eye, and that's unfortunate because I think a lot more people would become interested in astronomy and hooked on astronomy like me. That's what got me into sure. it was Halley's Comet. I saw Halley's Comet. I heard it was coming in 85. I contacted Dave Hustis of Skyscrapers. I went there. I, it was still, it wasn't until March. And then I kept following it throughout the, the season. And then, I, and then I just continued on observing everything yeah. else in the universe after the oh, comet yeah. left. So yeah. I think it would get a lot more peak people's interest, you know, but Unfortunately, it doesn't happen as often as right. It's, it's, there, there are a lot of comets out there, but they're faint. They might be tenth magnitude, twelfth. I mean, they're, they're nothing, you know. Totally, right. yeah. You know. Okay, so continuing on. Um, so now I want to talk about the missions to comets. This is basically the big, uh, the big focus of this presentation. Is that's why I called it journey to a comet because now we're actually going to journey to to comets via spacecraft. And there were actually six. I list five here. Um, Giotto was the first one, and this was launched in. Uh, in 85 by what's called ESA, European Space Agency. And uh, it, it actually approached Comet Halley in 1986, came within 273 miles of the comet. And uh, it found, and, and think about it, now we have actually direct evidence of what a nucleus looks like. I mean, Fred, uh, Fred, um, Fred Whipple uh, only surmised it based on indirect data. Here we have direct data. It's always great to have a direct image of something. And so here it is. Isn't that beautiful? March 13, 1986, pivotal moment for, we actually flew by Halley's Comet, okay? And it found the nucleus to be a dark carbon rich body measuring 9.3 miles, 4.3 and 6.2 with a thick dust covering, albedo of 3%. So it only reflected 3% of the light hitting it. Now these are the active jets. That's why they appear bright, but this dark part is what they're referring to. So it was indeed the, the dirty snowball that Fred Whipple had, uh, had stated. And um, the, the, ba the since I'm into meteorites, and some of you heard my meteorite lecture, the, the closest meteoritic analogs to, um, to comets, I would have called these uh, carbonaceous chondrites. This is very black. This is the Murchison meteorite here. All right. And then this one is, uh, this one is even closer. This is Ivuna. This is a C1. This is one of the most primitive meteorites. I keep it in a membrane box. It's very fragile. But uh, that's, that's the 
closest meteoritic analogs to a comet. So the nucleus show, and, and what's cool is the nucleus shows structure. Show, they, they even named some of these in other meteorites, but you could see here that it had hills and valleys, and you could see three areas where gas was coming out. Here's one, two, and then a weaker area there, three. And then um, the, quanti the quantity of, um, so 10% of the surface was active with at least three outgassing jets. The quantum material ejected was found to be three tons per second. Can you imagine that? Three tons per second. Uh, and then measured volume of material ejected 80%. So 80% of this three tons per second was water, 10% carbon monoxide, and then two and a half percent mixture of methane, ammonia, cyanide, and other hydrocarbons. They also detected iron and sodium. And what was interesting, see the fact that there was cyanide present, they detected it spectroscopically in 1910, and people were selling gas masks ripping off the public saying that, you know, we're going to pass through the tail of Halley's Common. We're going to be gassed to death with cyanide. <laughs> so, well, we do that every uh, twice a year with the uh, meteor shower. So, but uh, there's too little, it's all dispersed infinitely. So there's no worry about that. Okay, so here's a better uh, composite image. Isn't that beautiful? I think that is the most beautiful thing. Look at that. And see here, here's the three, the albedo that I was talking about, the 3%, the very jet black, very, very dark, just like these carbonaceous chondrites. So the ratio of abundance of light elements excluding nitrogen, such as hydrogen, carbon, oxygen, same as the sun. This implies that Halley is one of the most primitive uh, objects in the solar system and formed 4.5 billion years ago and remained practically unaltered since its formation. Because think about it, the comet for 76 years is way out in the Kuiper belt. It's frozen solid. It only comes in for just a few months, you know, maybe nine months or so around the sun. And then for another 76 years, it's frozen. So it really preserves, uh, it really preserves, uh, it's not really altered that much by its passage through the sun is what I'm trying to say. See, so that's why scientists are really interested in comets because they're one of the most primitive things in the solar system. And Halley's Comet had twice the amount of heavy water, D2O compared to normal water as the earth does. I have a slide on this later on. Um, what, one of the big theories is that um, Earth's oceans, you know, the Earth is three quarters oceans, came from comets because notice Halley, Halley's comet is ejecting three tons of material, 80% of three tons is water. So, you know, during the early bombardment period, we were bombarded with meteorites and comets that, you know, that's where our water came from. Now, uh, this theory is kind of come into question and I'll mention why. And deuterium is a uh, isotope of hydrogen. Hydrogen is uh, one proton and one electron. And, and an isotope is the same element with different number of neutrons. So if you add one neutron uh, uh, to hydrogen, it's called deuterium, it has a name. And uh, if you add two neutrons to hydrogen, you get tritium. And tritium is the radioactive one that they make hydrogen bombs from, okay? But uh, deuterium is very stable and you have deuterium deuterated water in your bodies and the uh, ocean has a lot of deuterium and we'll talk more about that later. And then the Giotto spacecraft also visited this other comet, but it was badly damaged so no pictures were taken. Okay, so one of the big things scientists wanted to know is what are the organic molecules in, uh, in a comet? And what, is in a, what does organic carbon mean, okay? Organic means carbon that is bonded to think of CHON, 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 carbon bonded to hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and hydrogen, CH, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, okay? So you see here, now normal, now normal carbon, uh, non-organic would be carbon bonded to itself, such as graphite or diamond or a new, form called fullerene, which was only discovered in the mid eighties. And um, which is C60, C70 buckyballs. 
And uh, if you see here, CH, CHO, CH, okay, CHO, and you can also have it uh, bonded to sulfur and, um, and uh, phosphorus too. And then this is the molecular way. And the molecular way, if you remember basic chemistry, carbon is 12 and then hydrogen is one. So methane would be CH4. So 12 plus four is 16, okay? But it's stripped of one hydrogen because it's an ion, so it's 15, see? So that's where the molecular weights come from, okay? And then I'm gonna talk more about these in another slide, but uh, uh, I'll teach you guys a little organic chemistry, but these, um, when you have carbon, hydrogen and oxygen, you can have what's called an alcohol or an ether or an aldehyde or a ketone or an acid or an ester, okay? And if it's connected to sulfur, it's called a thiol. And if you have double bonds, they're called alkenes. And if they're in a six-membered ring, uh, benzene ring, they're called aromatic. So I'm gonna talk more about all this later, but um, just kind of keep this in mind. So just remember for now, carbon, organic carbon is carbon bonded to C-H-O-N, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen, okay? And um, formaldehyde is, um, the uh, was discovered in uh, Halley's Comet, formaldehyde is embalming fluid, as you know. And uh, it's funny too, when you go to the supermarket and they say organic food, right? Think of it, all food is organic. It consists of carbon bonded to hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. <laughs> so it's kind of a, a misnomer, but what, what they're trying to say, it's higher grade food, but you know, technically all food is organic. It must be fun okay. in the supermarket. Huh? Before, you must be fun in a supermarket. Yeah. <laughs> well, then by that reasoning, all pesticides are organic too. Yeah, yeah, that's true too. That's true too, because they have carbon in them, yeah. Before you leave the uh, Giotto mission to Halley, I have another question. In yeah, sure. You. The, yeah. And now we're going to talk about any questions regarding um, Halley's Comet and the Giotto mission. See, that's why I, I have it all. Yeah, this is why you planted me in the audience. Yeah. The, the question comes from Jeff Benoit and wants to know yeah. if they did any measurements of the period, the rotational period of Car Halley's nucleus. Um, they did. Did I write it down here? No, I did not. Okay. The, the rotational period, Halley. Okay. Oh, See, now, ma now I'm making this better. I actually, you, you guys are the very first to hear this presentation. I wrote this back in 2019, and uh, I was going to present it in 2020, and then COVID hit. <laughs> so now I'm presenting it in 2021, and I've updated it since then. And um, and uh, so you guys are the very first to hear, but thank you. Yeah, that's something to write because I have rotational period of other comets in, in other ones. Thank you very much. That, that's uh, oversight on my part. Yeah, it's been measured. I, I just don't know what it is offhand. Yeah, hi, this is Jeff. I would just add to that. I was curious because looking at the jets, I was yeah thinking that if it, if it was locked to the orbital period, then one side would stay hotter whereas if it rotated rotated quickly it would be more uniform heating it might affect the the jets yeah. see it says here axis of rotation is this way so it's rotating like this i guess yeah but i yeah that that's a that's a good thing to write down i'm going to look that up in the next i'm giving this to the stars club on the 23rd so i'll have that in there <laughs> so any other questions? Um, yeah, Greg, this is Bill again. Yeah. Um, the the outgassing, uh, three tons um, of outgassing, that's really For remarkable. Second. Yeah, oh yeah, it is. And there's another comet that, um, I forget which one right now, that only outgasses one ton, and that's considered a dormant comet. Huh. So this is three tons, yeah. yeah. Um, did they, it is did, remarkable. That's why that's why scientists think the Earth's oceans came from comets. Mm -hmm. you know? and, and I'll see that that theory has been kind of um, put into question. Okay. Any other questions? Well, yeah, I was going to kind of go, go farther along with that, extend yeah. that. Did they have an estimate about how much material Holly's 
uh, the, the comet loses each time it it encounters the sun, and and then by extension can go back four and a half billion years and estimate it, how big it was when it started. Um, and I'm not sure about that. Um, I, I actually, that it doesn't. Uh, like I said, it um, right here. Um, it's the most primitive in the solar system. It remains practically unaltered since its formation because if you look here, the orbit, most of the time it's way out here. The, the coma doesn't form until it starts getting five times further from the sun than the earth. And then it swings around here pretty quickly and then it freezes again. So it's frozen most of its lifespan. See, so by the time we actually saw Comet Halley coming in, it was basically a year, 85, 86. And then for the other 74 years, it's frozen solid. See, so it doesn't really lose as much as you may think. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, but, um, but you know, four and a half billion years divided by uh, 87 is still a big number. Yeah. So I, I just, I, I'm going to probably follow that one up because... That's um, these objects as artifacts from the construction of the solar system. Right, right. Can, I mean, that you can kind of estimate how big they started. Um, and I guess maybe there's the question of when they actually uh, aggregated. Uh, right. But, uh, yeah, that must I, be I don't know if there's been, an, I'm not aware of any studies where like, trying to figure it you'd have to model that there's no way to know it with certainty but you know but knowing how it's outgas like you said how it's outgassing and and you know during each time it comes around and, and one way to know is next time it comes around um we'll send another spacecraft and photograph it and then they'll be able to see in 76 years how it changed because we have a pretty accurate uh you know, measurement here, 15 kilometers by seven by 10, we'll see if that shrunk any significant amount. You know what I mean? See, then we'll know that, oh, wow. And then from that, we can, you know, deduce longer periods of time, how big it might have been, right? You know what I'm saying? We probably need at least two of these measurements to be able to do that, but we'll have to wait till 20, what, 82 or something. It's coming back. It's coming back. <laughs> Greg? Yeah. This is Dave. Can I make a comment? Yeah, sure. Um, Jump in. Uh, I, I think I understand what Bill's asking. And the thing is, even though Halley is, you know, probably like 4.5 billion years old. Right. Okay. Um, that doesn't necessarily, at least I don't think it necessarily means that it has visited the inner solar system for that entire period of time. And the reason why I say that, and I'm not sure if I'm off the mark on this, but um, I thought maybe I'd read somewhere that the Kuiper belt was possibly populated originally from comets coming from the Oort cloud. Am I mistaken on that? It could, it could, but, uh, but Halley's Comet has come around a, a lot. See, it's, it's like I mentioned here, the comet, every passage has been recorded yeah, since right, 240 BC. But 240 BC is not, you know, okay. 0.5 billion years. Yeah, yeah, I know, you I know. know. Saying? So yeah, like, but, prior but to- your point is, is well taken that the, uh, the comet could have spent much of its time uh, well out in the, uh, in the Oort cloud before right. some stellar disturbance Right. It our way, which may have happened only a few thousand years ago. Yeah. Um, as I think Dave or um, Greg alluded, that periodic comets are thought to have been uh, perturbed out of the uh, right. Do have that correct? Yeah, and and they and they can scientists can usually tell by the um, where's the slide that shows that uh, by here they can usually tell by the. Uh, Short, where is it short and uh, 
here it is, short period comets, low orbital inclination, whereas the inclination can be anything. So if the inclination, which is, you know, how high it is to the ecliptic is lower, they know it's a shorter period comet. And then the, the rotation prograde, it spins in the same direction of its orbit, see? So they, they can tell by that usually that it's a short period or a long period comet, see? So. All right, well, we have a lot more stuff to cover. <laughs> any, any further questions? I really don't know the answer to that, like how big it was before and now and all that. I don't think anybody does really. That would have to be modeled and, you know. Sure, I, I just looked on Wikipedia that yeah. massive Halley's Comet is 2.2 .2 times 10 to the 14th kilogram. Mm. So that's a huge piece of ice. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's a good thing. Put the weight down too. All right, good. All right, now I can put more data in there. Thank you. <laughs> so you guys are helping me out and making this presentation even better. Okay, so moving on. Deep Space One encounters comet 19P Borley. P means periodic, okay? So this was launched in 98, and um, it actually went to this asteroid here, Braley. Okay, and it didn't take that great an image. And um, there were problems with tracking and uh, this is just the thing. And the spectral uh, type of this asteroid is dominated by olivine and pyroxene. And uh, olivine is, is uh, if ladies may know, olivine is uh, peridot. It's a semi-precious gem. And here's a meteorite that has, um, it's not a palace site, but can you see the, uh, the, the crystals behind it? Can you see the kind of translucent? See it? I think that looks pretty good. See the kind of translucent, the crystals, those, those are the olivine crystals. And uh, <clears throat> then uh, pyroxene is this, this is, uh, this is from, um, called Mildalil, it's a Eucrite. This is from the asteroid Vesta. They've been confirmed to be from Vesta. So let's look at, um, it, so a lot of these other uh, spaceship uh, missions also intercepted asteroids on the way there. So I just put one slide, some details on the asteroid. So the nucleus, so here's a comet uh, 19P Borley and uh, it's extremely dark, albedo of 3% and density of 0.3 gram per cubic centimeter. It's bowling pin, pin shaped. And uh, the nucleus, it has a variety of textures too, which I'll talk about in a bit. And the nucleus exhibit no trace of water, ice, or any water bearing minerals. And the comet's surface is, is inactive. Ice is present, but too little. And it's and the nucleus is actually quite hot, 300 to 245. Remember how you get Kelvin, um, you add 273 to the Celsius temperature. So uh, 20 degrees Celsius is 68 Fahrenheit. So 20 plus 273 is 293. So that would be room temperature in Kelvin. And uh, dust and gas appear escaping only from localized jets, less than 10% the surface as seen from spacecraft. So it's a weak producer of gas and dust and releasing less than a ton of water per second, as opposed to three tons for Halley. And the various terrains have been identified here. Okay. And then the comet's nucleus has a absorption at 2.3 microns right here. And scientists suspect this is a formaldehyde again, polymer formaldehyde. And, uh, and he, here's the uh, a mesa is a flat top hill. So these are kind of hilly areas on it here. So scientists like to look at structure on, on the comet and uh, kind of uh, correlate it. So. So any questions on, on, uh, on Comet Barley? It's basically pretty much a, a dead and dying comet. <laughs> but, but notice how the shape looks totally different than Halley. Each comet, each nucleus has a different shape. They're not, you know, a certain shape fits all. 
kind of thing. Okay, so moving on, Deep Impact -ish Mission to 9P Comet uh, Temple One. Now, th this is a great mission because this one actually launched an impact or projectile into the comet. So the comet is rather small, 4.7 to 3 miles for uh, albedo and density. And now look at this. A projectile hit the surface of the nucleus on July 4th, 2005, celestial fireworks. They Scientists did this on purpose, so it would be on July 4th uh, to commemorate Independence Day. Isn't that cool? So um, the stuff coming off of here was recorded by the spacecraft and sent back to Earth. So notice before when it hit, look at that. Isn't that beautiful? And then the probe, and then they recorded silicates, carbonates, smectite is a type of clay, uh, metal sulfides such as food, fool's gold, uh, amorphous carbon, and polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. And I'll talk about those in a bit. And they also had water, cyanide, methyl alcohol, and ethane. And methyl alcohol is not the drinking alcohol, it's ethyl alcohol, which is CH3, CH2OH. Methyl alcohol is poisonous and will, and if you don't die from it, you'll go blind. It has an affinity for the optic nerve and, and, and it causes blindness. Um, molecules in methane, moonshine, if you make moonshine, you get a certain amount of methyl alcohol in there. That's why it's dangerous. Um, so molecules such as uh, methane, ethylene, acetylene, and carbon monoxide were present post-impact. And water ice was detected um, and the ice was one meter below the crust. And then here's the, what the uh, spectrometer showed. This is all uh, signatures of water ice, the wavelength in microns versus intensity. This is, they couldn't really get a lot of detail, but complex organic molecules, carbon molecules. And then this is some of the uh, uh, minerals that were found here. And like I mentioned, olivine and um, and then uh, what was interesting too is um, during the time the uh, <clears throat> the deep impact could not actually image the uh, crater formed by this. So NASA did a really clever thing. They took a spacecraft that was already out there called Stardust, which we'll talk about in a bit, and they rerouted it afterwards to come back and visit the comet and photograph the actual site that uh, the actual crater formed by the impactor. And this was the first time that a comet was visited twice by spacecraft, isn't that neat? And uh, I saw on February 15, 2011, they identified the crater, here it is. Isn't that cool? Before and after. So, and then th this is just, unimaginable energy. <laughs> and then it ended up being 490 feet in diameter. And it had a mount with a crater. Isn't that neat? So, so we were actually able to image using another spacecraft that was on another mission, Stardust, that was rerouted to come back and visit, uh, and visit uh, this comet, uh, Temple One, and actually photograph where the impact occurred the crater, that, that's really phenomenal. Uh, that's really impressive. And this is the Hubble Space Telescope image during the impact that occurred. So any questions on the deep impact mission to Comet 9, Temple 1? So the basics of this is it we sent an impactor in and studied what came out rather than just what came out naturally, we actually went deeper into the comet. All right, so continuing on, the epoxy mission to 103P Comet Hartley 2. And uh, this, here's a close up of this comet. And uh, the nucleus is only 1.545 miles in length. And notice the density is always low and the albedo is always 3.4. And uh, the primary material being injected is carbon dioxide gas. And then the key findings include the, the value of deuterium to hydrogen ratio in the water is similar to that measured of Earth's ocean. So this is the first comet that they found that the 
deuterium to hydrogen ratio was similar to Earth's oceans. And I'm gonna talk more about that in detail in a future slide. Um, so the smooth relatively impact waste of the comet was probably been redeposited. So this is what they're talking about here, this smooth waste. Spins on one axis, but tumbles on around a different axis. And it has uh, larger rougher ends here and glittering blocky areas. And then these are more reflective. This is where the jets are coming out than here. And then here's a rotation of uh, Comet Hartley 2. So any questions on that? I'm gonna go rather quickly through some of these. See, I'm focusing more on the organic molecule kind of thing. I mean, there's so many directions you can go here. Okay, here's the Stardust mission. This was a really good mission. This was uh, this was sent to, to actually collect dust and bring it back, collect dust from a comet and bring it back to Earth, which it did successfully. Uh, the coma of comet, uh, it's not, it's pr actually pronounced Wild 2, uh, not Wild 2. We had a NASA ambassador um, teleconference on this and they stress that everyone's calling it wild too. It's pronounced built too. I don't know why they don't with a V but and a T, but that's how it's pronounced. And on its way there, it studied this asteroid 5535 Anne Frank. And here's, you can read this for yourself. And, uh, and then I mentioned here, it was codenamed next and it went back and, and uh, revisited the comet and photographed uh, the explosion site. And then this is the nucleus of Comet Will 2. So it flew within 149 miles, six times faster than a speeding bullet. The speeds these things are going at, it's amazing to be able to take a picture of that. So during passage, it collected dust and volatiles and um, size of the nucleus. Okay, and then uh, they use this stuff called Aerogel and being with the NASA ambassador program, uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory sent all the ambassadors actually an actual sample of Aerogel. Here it is. It's this light thing. It's called like liquid smoke. This is the actual stuff that they use to collect the, uh, the, the uh, cometary dust particles. See, and you can see them there. And they actually had a... Uh, <clears throat> a um, what do you call it? stardust at home, which was a uh, virtual thing that you could do. They had a little microscope, and you could focus and look at actual samples. I looked at over a thousand different different samples of this, and I had two candidates, and they were both not comet particles artifacts. But I, I participated in that citizen science thing. I think it's off the internet now. They've basically looked at everything. But uh, th this is kind of neat. And so the particles were fine grained, loosely bound aggregates, and they included olivine, forsterite, and enstatite. And olivine I showed you in this media right here. And enstatite is kind of a dark mineral. This is called an enstatite chondrite here. And uh, refractory or high temperature minerals containing calcium, aluminum, titanium, are uh, similar to CAIs and meteorites. And the Allende meteorite is, uh, I love this meteorite. Look at that. Doesn't that look, that look exotic? This, what you see here, the, these larger things here, that is a calcium aluminum inclusion. See it? So that's the largest one on this right there. Isn't that beautiful? So, so these are what they call high refractory or high temperature minerals. So these were the last things to precipitate out of the solar nebula. So they found these also in the uh, comet. Okay, so Comet Vil2 was rich in organic matter. So these are polyaromatic hydrocarbons. This is how they look. They're composed of carbon, bonded to hydrogen six member benzene, which are called aromatic fused rings. Has anyone here taken any formal courses in organic chemistry? Because um, you'd really appreciate this. So these were collected from stardust sample, benzene, naphthalene. Naphthalene is uh, mothballs, by the way. 
And uh, it's also, but check the label because they also use uh, paradichlorobenzene too. So, but uh, naphthalene is phenanthrene and pyrene. And then, so if you look here, here's how to read these things. See how these, this thing connects like that? There's a carbon here. So everywhere you see these things connecting is carbon, 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 carbon. Okay. Is we that... have one attendee with a degree in chemistry. Oh, Michael. good. So you'll appreciate. Oh, is that uh, is Michael that, uh... Corvace? Oh, okay, great. And uh, here, you you see you have four, uh, one, two, three, and then each of this comes four um, bonds around carbon, and then there's a hydrogen coming out of here. Okay, so each one of these has a hydrogen coming up. So that, that's how to read these, okay? And you wouldn't have it here because there's too many bonds. And these actually in what's called resonance, they're actually alternating within the molecule. So a lot of times you see it drawn as a circle. So these are PAS or polyaromatic hydrocarbons. Aromatic just means a benzene ring, poly means many, and they're all fused together. These are tar-like substances, okay? So a lot of the tar on roads are basically polyaromatic hydrocarbons. And if you ever get mothballs, May, check the label, it says naphthalene, has a, has a pretty nice odor, naphthalene, but it's kind of very chemically. <laughs> but, um, and then nitrogen containing molecules, methylamine, ethylamine, and this is really significant, amino acid, glycine. Amino acids are the building blocks of proteins found in all living organisms. So this is a very big deal that they actually found uh, uh, glycine in, in a meteorite, in a, in a comet. And now uh, amino acids are plentiful in meteorites. For example, this meteorite here, the Yen, uh, I mean, the Murchison uh, CM2 carbonaceous chondra. If you heard my talk on meteorites, this is the one that has the amino acids, the fatty acids, the sugars, the, uh, the DNA, uh, you, adenine, guanine, cytosine, uracil, all, all the nuclear nucleotides of, that are present in DNA. So this is what you need to jumpstart life. But the fact that the simplest amino acid is found glycine in, in, in a comet is really significant. So th this is one of the big reasons too, scientists sent the you know, spacecraft to these comets is to find out what the organic molecules are uh, that are present and how astrobiology and how this fits into the origins of life. So, um, so here, here's where, remember that one back in um, the Halley, during the Halley time? So th this is uh, functional groups, are active areas in the molecule where chemical reactions take place. So if you have a C double bond O, okay, so here, here we look at, um, so this is an alkane, it's just CH3, CH2, CH3, and this is called uh, aliphatic, which means straight chain without, and then aromatic would be a benzene ring. And then if you have uh, an alkene, you have um, a double bond here, carbon, carbon, and then you have a carbon here. If you have a triple bond, you have an alkyne, and cyanide is an alkyne, it's a C with a nitrogen here, CN with a triple bond. And then, and then an amine is, and then you see these, these dots here, these are what they call lone pair of electrons. This is what makes the molecule very reactive. So if it sees a center that has fewer electrons, it attaches and that starts the whole chemical reaction process. Okay, so an, so an alcohol is a COH. An ether is a COC. So see the difference between an alcohol and an ether? The alcohol is a COH and ether is a COC. And then uh, alkyl halide just means the halogens, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. Um, these are very reactive. Thiol means you have carbon connected to SH. And then with a C double bond O here, this is called an alkyl. And then, um, so here an aldehyde is C double bond OH. A ketone is C double bond C, so CH3, double bond O, CH3 is acetone, uh, nail polish remover, okay? And then an ester is C, 
and then a C here, and then there's a C there, and then C double bond OOH is a carboxylic acid. And if you add a CH3 here, which will be the simplest carboxylic acid, you probably had this with your salad for dinner tonight, that's acetic acid or vinegar. So acetic acid is a carboxylic acid. Isn't that neat? So you've ingested a carboxylic acid and they are acidic, okay? And then an amide is this carbon C double bond O and amide. And this is what um, amino acids are, the amide, they're connected together by amide bonds, okay? And then um, deuterium to hydrogen enrichment is three times that of terrestrial values in VIL2. We'll talk more about that later. And um, and this suggests that we're the result of proto-solar uh, nebular processes. Okay, so all right, we did that. A short course in organic chemistry, and then, and then here they named some of these areas here. Here's right foot. It does look like a foot, left foot, doesn't it? <laughs> it's kind of interesting. And then here's Shoemaker Basin. This is named after Eugene Shoemaker that discovered the Shoemaker-Levy comet. So any questions on uh, Comet Vil 2? Now, this was a big one because instead of sending a, a, a projectile and analyzing what came out, we actually collected dust samples and brought them back to, to Earth to analyze, which is even better. I so. just have one for your slides for the future. Yeah. Um, Comet Vil 2 was discovered by a Swiss astronomer, Paul Vilt. Oh. And because it's spelled W-I-L-D and he is Swiss, it is pronounced Wilt. That'll be good for your explanations. Oh, okay, sorry. So it wasn't German, it was Swiss. Oh, sorry. Swiss. All Wilt. Okay, just sounded, okay. All right, so next, Rosetta mission. So this is the last one now. Um, I have no idea how to pronounce this. is really hard to pronounce. Churi Murov, I think they're Russian names, but this is 67P comet. Everyone calls it 67P CG. Now this was by ESA, the European Space Agency. And this was like one of the crowning jewels was they actually landed a lander on the comet. Isn't that amazing? And um, so you can read a lot of this here. This orbits every six and a half years. And this is the complicated flyby. It actually passed the two asteroids, Steins and um, Lutetia. And, uh, and we'll talk, we'll mention those briefly. Here's asteroid Steins. And then what's cool about this, it has 40 uh, impact craters along its side here. So here's just some information on that. And it's classified as an E or Enstatite um, asteroid. And these are linked to a meteorite called an orbrite achondrite. And this is a beautiful Albright achondrite in my collection. It's called Pina Blanca Springs. Isn't that neat? And notice high albedo, 0.34 or 34%. See, notice it's whitish, this meteorite. So this is not, this is not the 3% that you get from uh, the carbonaceous chondrites. This is, you know, isn't that a beauty? So that's an enstatite chondrite, a chondrite. Okay, and uh, asteroid Lutetia, and this was actually a large asteroid. Look, 82 miles by 63 miles by 47 miles. That's pretty big. And uh, yeah, rotational period. I got to get that for Halley. And it, it has a spectral type M, but it's not metallic. It's actually a carbonaceous chondrite. Look deeper into that. It is classified as M, but it is but the outside is all carbonaceous. You can tell that's all carbonaceous chondrite. There's actually a, uh, a NASA mission that's coming, gonna be launched, I think around 2024. There's an asteroid Psyche it's called, which is an actual metal asteroid. We've never ever imaged a metal asteroid. So that, that's, that's gonna be something really exciting. Okay, so... Um, so here's the comet. It measures two and a half by 3.4 miles. So it's kind of a smaller comet, 6%. 
the mass density rotational period gravity this is interesting the gravity is so small that it takes to fall one meter which is three three feet three inches it takes 80 to 120 seconds it's not amazing it takes like two minutes to fall three feet <laughs> it's really amazing and then there's no electric field and what's really neat is the way this thing rotates it's doubly lobe the comet each lobe has a season i never knew comets could have seasons isn't that neat so each hemisphere here has a season that is wild um I'm going backwards okay so here's uh, a lot of this information here in a uh, pictorial and then, uh, so comet 67P revealed a double lobe structure, head and body separated by a narrow neck. Okay, some like it to the shape of a rubber duck. I, I really don't see a rubber duck in this, but either way. And they used uh, names for the regions, ancient Egyptian history and mythology. And if, and this, it's believed that this actually formed when two, Kilometer-sized cometesimals, two comets gently bumped each other and then stuck, accreted, and then started traveling together. Because it does look like, see, right here, two comets. This is one part and that's another. See, this is one part and that's another. So, and the neck has active jets. And then here, you um, can read some of this for yourself. Uh, two lobes, I mentioned that layers, this implies a lot of accumulation over time. A lot of the volatiles here, it is highly porous, um, low strength, low density, high porosity, and no alteration by liquid water. And then, um, and then the next one here, they talk about layering here, terrace, uh, they talk about terraces. That's what a terrace is. It's basically a step-like landform with one edge that's that's steeper than another. And, and then here, significant findings. Now, now, here's the organic stuff again. So electrons and not ultraviolet photons are responsible for the breakup. So molecular oxygen and nitrogen have been detected. Now, oxygen likes to exist as O2, okay? And same thing with nitrogen, unless you ionize it. But uh, in, the ab in Earth's atmosphere, oxygen is O2 and nitrogen is N2. And notice that's the same as the comet. Isn't that neat? And uh, the compound hydrogen bromide has been detected for the first time. And then Rosetta detected noble gases, krypton, xenon, argon. That's what's in, uh, these are the same gases that are in this orb here, my plasma orb. And uh, remember what an isotope is, say, uh, uh, element with same number, a different, same element with a different number of neutrons, okay? And a high abundance of argons, good correlation with it being forming in the cold outer regions and abundance of noble gases controlled by planetary. So th these are the um, conclusions here. And then this is methyl alcohol here. So you can see the spectra here, the molecular weight versus the intensity. Oh, this is the slide I've been, I've been alluding to. Remember, I kept talking about water and deuterated water and D2O and all that stuff. This is a slide that will put it all together now. Okay, so Rosetta instrument measured the D2O emanating from 67P. So this, so this basically is the oh, back. This is the the concentration of deuterated water. Notice deuterium natural abundance in Earth's oceans, one atom in every 6,420 of hydrogen. So think of it, there's a lot of deuterium in, in uh, the Earth's oceans, okay? So here's Earth, okay? And notice all the comets have much more enrichment in deuterium than Earth's oceans. If if Earth's oceans did come from comets, all of these would be on this line. The only one that is on this line is 103 P Hartley 2. 
and and this one just slightly above. But the only one that's really on that line is Hartley two. All the other comets, eleven comets, have been so far measured, and only and only one or two are known to be really close to this line. So, but notice ca uh, carbonaceous chondrites, this uh, Murchison here is up to 20% water, which is locked into this phyllosilicate matrix, uh, the meteorite. And I, I saw a documentary where they actually heated the meteorite and you saw water coming off. Okay, so there, there's extraterrestrial water here. Okay, and the deuterium concentration in this meteorite matches that of ocean. So even though asteroids have a lower overall content of water than comets, they could still have resulted in Earth's oceans because a lot of them during the early bombardment period, four and a half billion years ago, could have uh, given the Earth its oceans. Okay, and maybe not so much comets because based on the deuterium hydrogen ratio. Is that, is that making any sense now? Is that coming together for everybody? That's what I've been trying to get at. Okay. And then uh, Philly Lander, unfortunately, this was a partial success. The, uh, the Philly Lander uh, landed and, and then bounced. The harpoons did none of the harpoons anchored, and so it bounced into this shadowed uh, area here. And there's a close up of it from the spacecraft. So, and the problem with that is it couldn't reach, it wasn't on a sunlit area where it could recharge its battery. So, it only had 57 hours of battery life left. And so, it took as many scientific experiments as it can before it went silent. Be because the batteries ran out. And then the Philly probe collected materials and it found, it detected 16 organic compounds. And then uh, the ones in yellow have never been seen before in comets. And here's acetone nail polish remover. And they also found glycine, again, in, um, in uh, <clears throat> Glycine was also found in Ville too. And then phosphorus was also detected. Phosphorus is important because it's the backbone of the DNA and RNA molecule, and also in ATP and ADP, which is the energy for the cells. And uh, they found ethylene glycol here, which is uh, antifreeze for cars. Um, and then finally, Rosetta uh, grand finale, the spacecraft slowly fell onto the surface of the asteroid. And, and notice it fell 12.4 miles and, and at a speed of two miles per hour, it took 14 hours to drop. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? It just shows you gravity. And then, um, and then while it went down, it took a lot of data and everything. And, um, and then it went silent. So that's the end of the Rosetta mission. And then, uh, and then here's a complete rotation of uh, of the of the comet. See, it's two lobes, so the the theory is that it's two cometesimals that came together gently and accreted and just stuck together. Okay, so any questions regarding Rosetta or any part of this presentation? These are pictures. Uh, that I took myself, um, comets. And here's my first one of Halley's Comet in 86. This was in Beavertail State Park in Rhode Island. And uh, and then this is the, the most recent one, a comet Neowise. This is actually stack of about 10 um, pictures with deep sky stacker. And, and uh, you can see the dust tail and you can see the plasma tail there too coming up. So, so any, any questions, any part of the presentation? I don't have any in the chat right now. Okay. So if you want to ask a question, you can uh, open up your mic. So I know it was kind of a lengthy presentation, but I wanted to cover everything. And, and it, you always kind of have a certain slant, and my slant was the organic molecules, because that was a, a big thing. I like organic chemistry. I actually double majored in college. I'm going to bachelor's in chemistry along with pharmacy. And so uh, I loved organic chemistry the most. 
So it, it, it was amazing that, uh, you, you know, that, that's why I got so into meteorites. Well, once I found out that you can actually purchase these things and that there's uh, organic compounds in, in uh, a type of meteorite called the carbonaceous chondrite, I'm like, whoa, <laughs> I was just totally excited. So I could use my organic chemistry knowledge in, in astronomy, which whoever thought, you know. Yeah. So well, I surely like to thank you, Greg. Has anybody got any questions here while well, we still have his uh, expertise? No, but thank you. Thank you. This was fascinating. I mean, I came into this like I, I was uh, texting. Jim. I came into this thinking that I knew, you know, quite a bit about comets, but uh, <laughs> I, 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 I learned a tremendous amount here. Well, a, a lot of a lot of it was because of these missions too, you know, yeah. actually going. I mean, well, everybody basically knew all this stuff, you know, the the anatomy of a comet. Everyone knew the nucleus, the coma, the dust tail, the plasma tail, you know, the yeah. where they came from and all that, you know, but you didn't know all the this details about, you know, what the the um, spaceships found, you know, the spacecraft yeah. that actually visited these comets and saw the nucleus and flew through the through the you know well it's it's robots. fascinating how how very different they seem to be from uh from oh, yeah. asteroids oh yeah yeah they are and and actually yeah. that that one phaeton that you know causes the geminid meteor shower mm -hmm. uh, a comet would be indistinguishable from an asteroid if all of its gas and dust were used up it would basically be a carbonaceous chondrite it would be this mm -hmm. so if you add a lot of frozen dust and gas to this meteorite it's basically a comet <laughs> and you put it in the sun you know near the sun it, the, mm. the gases are going to sublime you're going to get the coma and they're going to get pushed back you know so i it, found especially unique is how so many of the comets look like so many of the asteroids with the two lobes and a connector yeah yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, Greg, before you sign off tonight, make sure you take a look at the chat. The phrase is coming fast and furious through there. So. Oh, okay. Wait, how do I see the chat here? Should be at the bottom of your screen, or maybe you close your presentation screen. You can see it, or when you do. Uh, wait, stop sharing. Okay. Yeah, do you see uh, the chat? 17, yeah. Yeah, oh, we have a bunch okay. in there. Oh, great. I'm glad everyone enjoyed it. Oh, Dave, you said you were going to say something at the end? Or? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, at the beginning of the presentation, Greg was talking about how Halley's Comet had really sparked his interest and he came up to skyscrapers and, you know, he really got bitten by the, um, the comet bug, I mm. guess you could say. And but I mean, he really, he just went right into it. And uh, of course, with his, you know, chemistry background and everything from his college days, I mean, you know, he, he went along that avenue. But, you know, I, I mean, I think Greg had gotten a, an eight inch um, a C8, I think it was. Yeah. And, um, you know, I remember, I remember one day, you know, I get a call from Greg. He goes, hey, buddy, you hear about the new comet? And I go, no. He goes, yeah, it's comet such and such. And he told where the constellation was. And I, I go, Greg, what's what's its magnitude? He goes, ten point two. <laughs> Remember what what you what I told you, Greg? Yeah, yeah. You wouldn't bother with it, but I was excited no, because no, well, it wasn't quite that. Because I mean, you know, yeah. I still think comets are cool, especially yeah. you realize what they are, where they've come from, and everything. Mm. But you know. I do a lot of done a lot of public outreach, and you can't get um, the public interested. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, I agree about that. A ten point two fuzzball. Yeah, I know. So, I agree. I agree. So I told so I told Greg, call me back when it's four point oh. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. And Neo Wise was was pretty good. I mean, it was a great binocular comet, and you could barely see it naked <clears> eye. <throat> But it was during the COVID time, the heart of COVID, you know, like just around yeah. the lockdown. Well, so we couldn't people, have any, any uh, public. People were getting great shots with their iPhones. Yeah. 
you know, I mean, and talk about, you know, you're talking about the technology back when you were starting and then look how far it's gone in those really short number of years. And the, some of the images that people were getting on their, you know, the cell phone cameras were absolutely incredible. Mm. Greg, you have a question on the chat. Yeah, I see um, it. I I don't know, red sodium tan. Let's see, because sodium usually fluoresces uh, yellow. And um, I, I'll look into it. I'll look into it. Red sodium tail of Comet Neowise. Yeah, and don't forget to turn the host back over to me, too. Oh, go into the participants list. How do I do that? Our see the security. Question? Participants? Remove participant? Or? No, neither don't, don't want to do that. Okay. You'll either find yours and turn off host or find oh. mine and make host. All right. Um, why do I see the host? This, it's part of your name. Uh, oh, host. Yeah. All right. More. So what do I do? What does it say host. under more? Uh, rename. All right. Then go up to mine and make host. Uh, John. More stuff. Make host. Yep. John. Yeah, right. You want to change? Good. Yes. Okay. You that, should not it. be the host. Okay. I am. Thank you. And another question. Okay. Or is, it, or is it a comment? I've got a question. All right. Uh, oh, Bob Napier? Yes. Hey, I, part I, of the original ladies crew. All right. I knew it. <laughs> uh, since you moved down south uh, in the Tampa area, I think. Yeah. Uh, how is the, the weather down there as far as astronomy is concerned? Do uh, you have very many clear nights that are... Oh, yeah, yeah. Warm? It's... Oh, good thing you said that. It's it's um, it's better than New England. What what happens is during the winter months, it, it's fantastic. We get a lot of clear days. All right, it, it's a dry season, and um, the seeing is a lot better. And for three mm -hmm. reasons, because one, I'm closer to the equator, so like the planets will be higher up. The constellations are higher up. Okay, like. Uh, uh, Scorpius is a, the tail of Scorpius doesn't just clear the horizon. It's a lot higher up. And uh, w what's neat is the Big Dipper actually sets. <laughs> it's not circumpolar. And Cassiopeia sets too. They're not circumpolar. So that, I found that unusual. And the North Stars, I'm only 27 degrees above the horizon, so they're like 42, 43. And the second thing is I live near the water. So the water kind of modulates it near the Gulf of Mexico. And then third, um, two and a half actually, I don't have a jet stream all the time. So I check the internet to see if there's a jet stream above me. And if there's a jet stream, the scene's not as good. But given all those factors, the scene is a lot better. The thing that's a negative is we have a lot of water vapor in the atmosphere. So that scatters a lot of light, but it doesn't really interfere so much when you're doing deep sky or planetary imaging, you know. If you get a lot of haze, it's not good for deep sky, but it doesn't really affect planetary. But the wind, the summers now are a different story. We get the hurricanes, so you get a lot of cloudy nights, very muggy. It doesn't clear up to like after midnight. It usually clears up at 2 a.m. So we kind of call it summer shutdown, <laughs> like shutdown mm -hmm. for the summer. So for public nights, we don't do any public nights during the summer until October again. You know, but if you want to observe during the summer, you got to get up around 2 a.m. to because throughout the the evening, once the sun sets, it's usually always cloudy and start raining, and you know the, the weather's bad in the summer. But the winters, the, the weather's very nice. Yeah, like today was perfectly clear and it was 80 degrees, but it's too hot because it's just going to get hotter. And the summers yeah, with the humidity. <clears throat> They've gotten a lot worse. I, when we first moved down here in 1990, during the winter, we were wearing uh, winter coats and sweaters and and uh, blue jeans. And now in the winter, I wear shorts and a t-shirt and I, I hardly wear winter clothes anymore. It's changed that much. Only mm -hmm. one or two days, it'll get like in the 40s and you, you were like freezing, and, but then it breaks two, three days later, and it's back up in the 60s again. But 
the winters, 2010 was the coldest winter on record. A lot of manatees died, a lot of plants died. I remember it was in the 30s, like for three months, mm -hmm. 2010 into 2011 was the coldest. Uh, but after that, it's been, yeah. So that's basically the, the weather climate now in Florida, yeah. Greg, I'm going to ask you for let take one last question before we have okay. to move on to our business meeting. Okay, sure. Uh, amino acids can tolerate extreme heat, yes or no? Um, not extreme. I wouldn't say extreme heat. The amide bonds would would break like an acid, like your stomach mm -hmm. acids. That's what they do. They break. A, a steak or a hamburger, which is protein into individual amino acids that are absorbed, but extreme heat, it, it may, but it, it, it's kind of, it's kind of cold out on in the. Uh, well, she's referring to how they could possibly have made the oceans. Oh, well, the, no, no, that's not the amino acids. This is the the D two O, the the heavy water, the deuterium content in the water. That's a whole different story altogether. Uh, if you boil deuterated water, it'll stay deuterated. It doesn't change, so it doesn't matter how hard it is. It will stay D two O because it takes a lot. Uh, see the electron to strip an electron from an atom doesn't take that much energy, but to get something out of the nucleus takes mm -hmm. a lot of energy. Okay. That that's why nuclear power releases so much energy, like an atomic bomb. Okay. So the neutrons don't come out so easily. They may radioactively decay, but that's pieces of it. But the, you know, it, it'll stay deuterium is a very stable isotope. It stays deuterium forever <laughs> to my knowledge the heat upon entry on amino acid um well the heat upon entry like if if it's coming in from a uh, meteorite like this uh where's my here it is if if this meteorite comes in this is frozen solid in, in the solar system, which is still very cold, a few degrees Kelvin, okay? It, it's only in the atmosphere for less than 60 seconds. So mm -hmm. the, and these things are throughout the whole meteorite. So maybe the exterior part, which is called a fusion crust, maybe there they're cooked, but deep inside the meteorite, they're intact because it's still cold. What, what if uh, one big misnomer is a lot of people think, oh, if you touch a meteorite once it lands, it's gonna be, it's gonna burn you. It, they're usually not even hot to the touch, warm to the touch. They're still pretty cold. Some people have said that's eh, slight heat, but they can just pick it up. It doesn't hurt at all. They, they've been frozen solid for so long. The 60 minute seconds or so it takes to come through the atmosphere mm -hmm. is nothing. Really doesn't destroy the organic mm -hmm. molecules within the whole rock, only on the outer surface. You know? All right. Thank you again, Greg, and thank you for all the other clubs that came to join us tonight. Okay, thank you. Uh, it was a pleasure. Thanks, Greg. Yeah, Have a good thank one. you, Greg. Yeah, you're welcome.